Brethren, Brother Richter's sermon text will be in Ephesians 6.15. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. God Almighty, I pray for Brother Victor that he would bless us. And I pray that we'd have ears to hear. And thank you for all of the sermons today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 In the splendid summer that was 1958, I was at Pine Lake Bible Camp in Eldor, Iowa, and my father preached a message about the gospel of peace, and it um, took to my heart, and I stood on the shores of Pine Lake that sultry summer evening and made the good confession that has been made by millions of martyrs and legions now living I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And I still believe that, and I always will. Some 1900 years before my conversion in 1958, in the year AD 58, the Apostle Paul took his pen and wrote these words in Romans 10, 16, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. Amen. Do you have beautiful feet Amen. tonight? Now Paul is quoting from Isaiah, and this passage goes a little further back in time to 700 years before Christ came. But this is what Isaiah the prophet said in chapter 52 and verse seven. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace, who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaim salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Do you have beautiful feet? And again, in our text that was just read by the young man, in writing about the full armor of God, Paul says, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The NIV puts it this way, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. So I ask tonight, are your feet fitted with the preparation or readiness of the gospel of peace? If we would walk in the steps of our Lord Jesus, and his apostles and the early Christians, then yes, we will have beautiful feet. These pertinent passages remind me of that wonderful hymn written long ago by Mary Slade, Footprints of Jesus that make the pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus where'er they go. Yes. Even if they lead or the cold, dark mountains. When I gave my life to Christ in 1958, I had no idea that in 2004, his path would lead me on the cold, dark mountains of North Ossetia, as George Bayensky from Canada and I traveled over treacherous mountain passes that were guarded by Chechnyan rebels to take thousands of dollars from American and Canadian Christians to our brethren in Beslan, North Ossetia on the Chechnyan border who had experienced that terrible school massacre where 350 children were murdered by Chechnyan rebels, including 15 young people from the Evangelical Christian Church in Beslan. I thought of them tonight, those young martyrs, as I stood watching these young people sing with gusto and zeal, you don't know what singing a song and making the good confession and hearing about the gospel of Christ and singing a song like that is gonna to mean to you someday. Amen. Let's start talking about our feet. The feet are literally the lowest part of your body but they hold up the rest of your body. Napoleon said an army marches on its stomach, but it still takes men marching on their feet 
to bring food to the troops, doesn't it? <laughs> My father had a placard in his study. I have never forgotten it. I had no shoes and complained until I met a man who had no feet. Feet are essential to the body. Paul tells us the head cannot say to the body, I don't need you, cannot say to the feet, I do not need you. Oh, yes, you do. <laughs> there are beautiful feet and then there are ugly feet. Ugly feet, according to Proverbs 6.18, are quick to rush into evil. But beautiful feet are eager to run into the battle with the gospel of peace. We are the feet of the body. We are not the seat of the body. We are to get up and go with the gospel of peace. Billy Graham said the greatest form of praise is the sound of consecrated feet seeking the lost and the helpless. Again, may I quote from Mary Slade's hymn, Footsteps of Jesus. If they lead through the temple holy, preaching the word, or in homes of the poor and lowly, serving the Lord. I remember the day when I was a young minister in my home church there in Hamburg, Iowa. Ronald Emberton, a godly elder, went to the home of poor Nettie Dankoff, a widow, took me with him. As he read the Bible to her, and as he talked to her about spiritual things, she said, oh, Brother Emberton, my toenails are just killing me and I can't bend over to trim them. Without missing a beat, that godly man reached into his pocket, got a pair of clippers, got down on his knees, continuing to talk to her all of the while, while he trimmed her toenails. We can preach in the temple holy all day long, but serving the Lord in the home of the poor and lowly is also a part of having beautiful feet. Shod. That's a funny word, isn't it? Shod. Having shod your feet with a preparation of the gospel of peace. Today we think of horses being shod, not men and women and boys and girls. We don't go to the shoe store and say, uh, can you shod my feet today? No, we go to have our feet fitted or measured. That's what my mother did with me when she took me to a Buster Brown store or a Red Wing shoe store, if you can remember those. Feet that are not properly fitted can be painful and even harmful. So I do think the NIV here is best with your feet fitted, but still remember the context. Warfare, armor. There's an old song, I'm on the battlefield for my Lord, and we're on it 24-7. Albert Barnes said this word shod literally means having underbound the feet. Soldiers then wore shoes with hobnails to hold firm to the ground, especially when they were engaged with hand-to-hand -hand con uh, combat with the enemy. And I would uh, liken them to the cleats that are worn by college and professional football flair players today who are going up against their opponent, especially the linemen. They have to have a real grip in the ground so they can stand their ground against the opponent. And the Bible uses phrases in Ephesians 6 like, take your stand and stand your ground and stand firm. Peter Marshall for quite a while was the chaplain of Congress and also the conscience of the Senate in our nation's capital. One day he prayed this prayer, Lord, give us clear vision that we may know where to stand and what to stand for, because unless we stand for something, we shall fall for anything. That's a powerful prayer. <laughs> and how America has fallen for anything in these last days. Perhaps the best known Christian apologist today is a man named Ravi Zacharias. 
And recently he said this, and I quote, these days, it is not just that the line between right and wrong has been made unclear. Today, Christians are being asked by our culture to erase the lines and move the fences. And if that were not bad enough, we are now being asked to join in the celebration cry by those who have thrown off the restraints religion has imposed upon them. So it is not just that they ask us to accept, but now they demand of us to celebrate it too. I think of Martin Luther, who 500 years ago this October, in 1517, stood in the dock and said these words, I cannot and I will not recant anything for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand, I can do no other so help me God. And may God help us to stand with such conviction against sin and error in these last days. Shoes are needed for protection. Any of you that have worked in heavy equipment or construction workers know that you wear steel-toed shoes. But the right shoes are also needed for speed, not only protection, but speed. Runners in track and field events wear spike shoes for speed. The Living Bible says, wear shoes that are able to speed you on as you preach the good news of peace. And we need to speed on because time is running out. We need to hasten the day of God's return by speeding on our way with the gospel of peace because so many people today have never once heard the good news of peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So again, I remind you, our text says that we are the feet of the body and not the seat of the body. Don't you know, O oh Christian, you're a sermon in shoes is an old song. Be the last of a dying breed, the shoe leather evangelist that goes over the mountains to tell people about the peace that passes all understanding. When I was a little boy, just like this boy that was up here reading scripture and praying tonight, growing up in my home church in Hamburg, Iowa, we used to sing this little chorus written in 1944, the year before I was born, and I still love it. I hear it on the radio from time to time. Boys and girls for Jesus, this our earnest prayer. Boys and girls for Jesus, home, at school, at play, and everywhere, we'll tell the world of life in Jesus. He is all our song. There is all you need in Jesus. Won't you come along? That song really got a hold of my heart when I was a little boy, and if you've never sung that one, young people, that's one you can learn to sing too. Number three, we come to this word preparation. Our feet are to be shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Preparation means that the Christian soldier is to be prepared or ready to go into battle at any time, any place, armed with a gospel of peace. Our nation's first commander in chief, George Washington said, to be prepared for war is one of the most effective means of preserving peace. And that's the same in the kingdom of God. That's how we win this war, by winning men and women, and yes, boys and girls, to Jesus with the announcement of peace through the gospel. The New American Standard Bible rendering of Isaiah 52, seven says, how lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who announces peace and brings good news of happiness, who announces salvation. If there is no good news in your message, if there is no peace in your message, 
if there is no happiness in your message, if there is no salvation in your announcing this message, then you, my friend, are preaching the wrong message because that's the message that was preached. Preparation is absolutely essential to success in any endeavor. I believe with all my heart that lack of preparation is a sin against God. God prepared a wonderful plan for man. And if we are not prepared to share that plan and articulate that plan and plead with other people to believe and accept the man of that plan, Jesus Christ, then we are sinning against God. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God, Isaiah 40, verse 3. And later in chapter 62, verse 10, prepare the way for the people. Build up, build up the highway, remove the stones, raise a banner for the nations. That's our duty still today. Several years ago when I was preaching in London, England, I had the privilege to visit St. Paul's Cathedral, Westminster Abbey, some other historic church buildings, cathedrals. And I noticed, and I knew this was true, but I noticed it when I visited Westminster Abbey, that David's, David Livingstone's body is buried in the very center of Westminster Abbey. All around him on the perimeter are kings and queens and famous people, politicians, but in the center is the body of David Livingston because that's what England once stood for. Sending the gospel of peace into the world. Why? Because he was prepared. This was his testimony, listen to it. I am prepared to go anywhere provided it be forward. I determined never to stop until I had come to the end and achieved my purpose. God give us a million more David Livingstons for this world. Jack Hiles used to preach up in your country, didn't he? Up in Indiana, Hammond, wasn't it? A prepared person will always have his opportunity. But an unprepared, now I'm quoting here, an unprepared person will never have that opportunity. So you must be prepared with the gospel of peace. And that brings us forth and finally tonight to the gospel of peace itself. Does it trouble you that most of the people in the world tonight do not have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ? When our Lord saw people like that, the Bible says he was moved with compassion. Why? Because they were helpless and they were harassed and they were a people without a good shepherd. The older I get, the more I feel what I did not feel when I was a young preacher and that is genuine compassion for people who have never heard the gospel of Christ. And I desire to have a greater compassion for the lost and for the sick and the elderly and the dying. Because I'm three of the four. I hope you know which three. <laughs> Recently I came across this quote and it really haunted me for several days. Man's sorrows will often not let me sleep. Jesus was the man of sorrows, right? That's right? And you don't read about Jesus sleeping too much, do you? The one time he did get to sleep, they woke him up in the boat. But he spent long nights in prayer. The son of man came to seek and save the lost. I think the lost was on his heart. The work of redemption is what he came to do. Every Christmas, we sing, peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Thank you, Charles Wesley, for sharing that song with us for sure. And I wanna say here and now and forever and ever that there will 
be no peace on earth until and unless we claim and proclaim the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, as the only answer to the problems and the pain and the suffering and the lostness of this world. He is their only hope. He is their only chance. Charles Brent said this, peace comes when there is no cloud between us and God. Peace is the consequence of forgiveness. God's removal of that which obscures his face and breaks union with him. So let me leave you tonight with seven powerful passages of scripture. I'll go through them quickly. Like the old preacher down south who said, and in conclusion, but not quickly. <laughs> so this is in conclusion, but not too quickly, because I want you to get these seven passages down. Number one, 700 years ago, it was prophesied that Messiah, Jesus the Christ, would be the Prince of Peace and that there would be no end to his government, Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. So it's still in operation today. We have a privilege and a responsibility to, be, to make sure that that happens. Number two, it was further prophesied that this Messiah, Jesus the Christ, would speak peace to the nation, Zechariah 9.10. And I like that so much that that's the biblical motto for our ministry, Peace on Earth Ministries, proclaiming peace to the nations, because that's what Jesus said he would do, and that's what he wants us to do as well. But while we do this, while we proclaim peace to the nations, whether it's in America or Canada, or anywhere around the world. Remember the words of Francis of Assisi, while you are proclaiming peace with your lips, be careful to have it more fully in your heart. Number three, Jesus Christ himself is our peace. Ephesians 2.14, Christ himself is our peace. He made both Jewish people and those who are not Jews one people they were separated as if there was a wall between them, but Christ broke down that wall of hate by giving his own body. That's in the New Century Version. I have not seen a time in my lifetime, lifetime when there is so much hatred between people in America, and it troubles me. But I also know that only Jesus can replace that hate with peace. Maybe you used to be a hater, but now you're not that way anymore. And it's only because of God's peace that came into your heart. Number four, Jesus Christ made peace possible through the highest price, the blood of his cross. Colossians 1.20 says, through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth, human beings, things in heaven, heavenly beings, by making peace through his blood shed on his cross. William Barclay said, we do not really love Christ until we are prepared to face his task and take up his cross and preach his cross. Number five, Jesus Christ came and preached peace to everyone. Ephesians 2, 17 and 18, he came and he preached peace to you who were far away. That would be the Gentiles and peace to those who were near. That would be the Jewish people. For through him, through Christ, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. The gospel of peace is for all. Amen. Number six, Tonight, you and I can have peace with God, but only through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5, 1 and 2 says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace 
in which we now stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Notice the transition here. Now we stand on the firm ground of grace. Number seven, the God of peace. This is from Romans 16, 20. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. And that's why it's so important to have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Ultimately, our feet will have a huge part in the defeat of Satan. And so we have come full circle, have we not, in this sermon tonight, back to the feet. When we dress out with the full armor of God, the full armor of God, you can't miss a single piece. And have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace and take our stand, this stand that we now take, Jesus Christ will someday crush Satan under our feet. What an amazing thought. That beautiful feet will crush the head of the hideous accuser of our brethren. What an anomaly to see those two in the same thought there. In conclusion, God is called the God of peace in 1 Corinthians 7, 15, and he has called us to peace. But my question is, <clears throat> have you answered that call? God is calling us to put shoes on our feet so that we are prepared to spread the good news of peace. But do you hear that call? Old William Booth, founder of the Salvation Army, preached from this verse once and he said, not called, did you say? Not heard the call, I think you should say, Put your ear down to the Bible and hear him bid you go and pull sinners out of the fire of sin. Put your ear down to the burdened, beating, agonized heart of humanity and listen to their pitiful wail for help. Go and stand by the gates of hell and hear the damned entreat you to go to their father's house and bid their brothers and sisters not to come here. And then look Christ in the face whose mercy you have professed to obey and tell him whether or not you will join heart and soul and body and mind in the march to publish his peace and mercy to the world. And right now I am thinking of some lines in that grand old hymn, Living for Jesus. Such love constrains me to answer his call, follow his leading, and give him my all. And then comes the chorus that Thomas O. Chisholm wrote which I will close as a prayer to this sermon. O oh Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to thee. For thou in thy atonement didst give thyself for me. I own no other master. My heart shall be thy throne. My life I give Henceforth to live, O Christ, for thee alone.